Hi, hi there. My name is Magnus Carlsson. I work at the Intel office in Stockholm, Sweden, with uh, low-level uh, software and also with hardware, actually. Uh, currently focused on telco, networking, hypervisors, stuff like that. And I have uh, two partners in crime here. Hey, I'm Bjorn, uh, and I'm working with Magnus, based in Stockholm as well. And I'm um, John Fasterband. I introduced myself earlier, but uh, this is one of my networking projects, and I work for uh, Covalent IO, and uh, give it back to these guys here. Okay, thank you. So, what is this about? Not that. <laughs> okay, so what's the motivation here? So, if you take a bunch of networking developers and you ask them, what's your preferred platform? My guess is that like 99.9% .9 of them will say Linux. Because it has lots of good features, it works, and they're used to it. But what if now you have like a DPI application, and you want to use something like AF Packet, but it doesn't give you the performance you need. I mean, you can't add as many cores to the system as you want. Maybe because there's no servers that large, or maybe because if you add that many cores to your system, the price of that system will be out of range and you can't sell your product. So what are the solutions that, what do you do? Well, today you go, might go to something like, you know, a Cavium, you know, and where their, their proprietary hardware SDK. Or you might buy a NIC card for like high frequency trading or high performance computing with their own proprietary hardware SDK. Or you might go to something like DPDK. I mean, the problem with these are they're, they're hard to use. They're not like AF Packet. I mean, you have to rewrite your app to use them. Uh, you can also go to something like PFRing, NetMap, uh, RDMA, you know. Some of these, they have, you know, little or no integration to Linux, especially the, the two top ones. They have no integration to Linux, so a lot of things will not work. And with PFRing and NetMap, they're not in Linux, so that has some problems too. RDMA is in Linux, but it's not part of the Linux net subsystem. So what if we then could take, you know, the functionality and ease of use of AF packet in Linux with the networking performance of this latter solution. So take some of the goodness and the good stuff that they've developed here in RDMA and NetMap and transfer it to AF packet. So how can we do that? That's the problem statement. So our proposed solution is then to introduce a new fast packet processing interface in Linux. And we simply call it AF packet v4 because it should be a logical continuation to, you know, v2 and v3. It has no system calls in the data path. Uh, by default, it's copy mode, just like v2 and v3. But you can enable a true zero copy uh, mode, and that is what's going to give you most of the performance uh, bang for the buck. Uh, and with that mode, the DMA buffers are mapped straight into user space from the NIC. So it's really true zero, zero copy. But note that the hardware descriptors are only mapped to the kernel. They are not visible from user space. User space only sees virtual descriptors. These are the V4 descriptors. So the kernel will translate the hardware descriptors to the virtual V4 descriptors. But the packet go straight into user space. So one very important thing here is that this zero copy mode requires hardware steering support for untrusted applications. Because if you have two destinations, two processes, then the hardware has to make the decision on where, where to go there. If, if you have a, a port or a piece of hardware where everything just goes to a single destination, then you of course you don't need hardware steering. But if you have two or more, then you do need this. If you don't have that, you have to copy the packet out into user space. And then of course it's not true zero copy anymore. Our goal here is to hit 40 gigabits a second, which is line rate for a 40 gigabit card on a single core for large packets, and about 30 gigabits a second for small packets, 64 bytes. That's our goal. And if you see, where did we do the implementation? If you look at the picture here, then most of the implementation here is in the new V4 socket layer. We have some code in the Linux uh, NIC driver, and also some piece of code on top of that. There's no changes or no contributions at all into the general path of the INET, you know, datagram sockets. We have no code there. It's only for the AF packet path. So just to give you a high level summary of the results. So we have implemented this v4 in AF packet.c. 
It also requires for the zero copy mode two new NDOs to be implemented in the driver for this support. Uh, we also introduced something we call packet arrays to facilitate this implementation to give you know really good performance and also to abstract away some parts of the of the v4 implementation. Uh, we also try to integrate it with XTP so that if you implement this zero copy support you also get XTP support. Uh, for free is within quotation marks. Nothing's ever for free, so it has to be always has to be some rearrangement of stuff. But really, it should really facilitate uh, XTP integration in there too. Results. Uh, so we did this. Uh, we have a couple of test programs, and we took this RFC that we have out for a ride. And with the V4 and packet zero copy, we got like six to forty times the throughput of V2 and V3, which I think is is good on an i4 Enic. We get 40 gigabit line rate for Rx uh, on one single core for large packets, but we're not there for Tx and not for small packets either. Uh, so we really need much more optimization work. We haven't really started optimization work, to tell you the truth. Uh, we focus on other things. But I still think, I mean, it looks, looks very promising, the performance. And it's this whole thing, I mean, if you can get performance like this, it should lessen the need for SRV because we see some use cases where people just use virtual functions straight up to user space, you know, with all the disadvantages of that. And hopefully with this, they stop doing that and using a real interface instead. Okay, so that was the elevator pitch. It's a very long elevator, but still. So what are we going to do? So we're gonna first going to talk about this new interface V4. This is the interface towards between kernel and user space. And after that, go into the details of the zero copy support and how that's implemented, uh, especially how it's implemented with packet arrays after that. And then we get into the XDP integration of this because XDP is exciting in, in, in terms of V4. We think we can do a lot of cool things with XDP in conjunction with V4. And then we'll show you performance results, speculate a little bit about future work, especially we're gonna tell you a lot about the work uh, around the RFC and then conclude. Just note something here. So we published this RFC uh, last week. So this talk is all based on that RFC. And during this, uh, these days, we've got lots of feedback from you that will change that RFC for sure. Uh, so we'll try to weave in that feedback into this talk. But just, you know, I mean, this talk, the paper, it's all about the RFC. It's not about the next version of the RFC. Um, Yes, and we should uh, admit something. The RFC actually did not compile on Motorola 68K. Some K-Build robot told us. So if you're planning on taking this RFC on a ride on your Amiga, you should wait for the V2. <laughs> okay, so what's the motivation about a new interface? So why, why do you do that? I mean, So for V4, we really wanted to support true zero copy mode. In order to do that, it has to be simple because hardware is simple. So you have to have linear buffers and just doing it as simple as powerful as possible, you know, not having many features in it. So it'd be simple and rather stupid. Uh, we also want to eliminate copies for TX and buffering. So if you get a packet in on RX and you want to do something with it, maybe inspect it and then resend it out again, you should not have to copy it into a TX buffer. There should be no copies there. So if something arrives on RX, you should be able to just send it out without a copy, which is good for DPI. Also, if you want to buffer this, let's say you have some higher level reassembly you need to do. Maybe the IP packets are fragmented, for example. Uh, then you should not have to copy this uh, packet out of the buffer in order just to keep it around for a couple of milliseconds or you know a second. You should just be able to leave it and then send it. So avoiding copies in the application too. We also want to have the transparent error reporting on every packet, if you want that. So why is that important? Well, if you have a system like, you know, these, these things, mobile phones, the value of your data is going to deteriorate very, very quickly. Because the, the data that you send, it's actually tuned towards the interface in the air. So it's only good for a single moment. And if you send it at that moment, it's going to have very low error rates. But if you resend it, the same data, five milliseconds later, you might have hundreds of errors. 
So it's really important if you can't send something that you know it immediately and either just resend it immediately or just say there's no point. If I send it now, I'm going to destroy performance of the system. So for telecoms, that's telco, you know, baseband stacks and stuff like that. That's very important. And of course, we want it to be faster than V2 and V3. If it's not, why are we doing this? Yeah. And also to be integrated with XDP. And we'll tell you much more about that, and Björn will tell you much more about that later, why we think that's important. And also one other goal. Uh, we're not really there yet. If you actually implement the zero copy support in your driver, we want you to get XDP support for free in there. It should just be integrated into it. So those are the goals. So if we look at the format, so what does it look like? So we have two descriptor rings, RX descriptors and TX descriptors, just like in V2 and V3. Uh, but they look different. So this is the descriptor format here. So, so we start with uh, having an ID here. And this is the ID of a buffer. So you can see here there's no buffers, data buffers following the descriptor. All data buffers are in this packet buffer over here. So descriptor enters point to what packet buffer. So there's an indirection. For example, the one there means that, OK, my data is in descriptor number one over in the packet buffer. And of course, 22 there. So it's a 32-bit ID. Then we have a length. We have offset to tell you where the data starts. So you can have metadata and, and, and things like data headroom. And we also have an error on each single message, so you can get error ba errors back. And there's a set of flags and also some padding because we want this descriptor to be 16 bytes, so you can fit four on a, if you have a 64 byte cache line. So we padded up uh, with an extra four there to get that. Uh, something to note here, there's no data header in V4. And the reason for that is performance. If this, uh, if the packets get in RX on a sing on one core, and you have your application very likely on another core, then we want on want that core to touch the data. It should be touched by, you know, user space instead. If both uh, the core receiving the interrupt and, and doing this translation, the driver, and the application touches the data, we can get the performance decrease up to 50%. So half the performance, because you have to read in all your data into one cache, and it has to be transferred over to the other one. And that's expensive. And also another reason for not having a data format is that we can just use an XDP frame. So we don't have to you know, translate anything. So we think that's a, you know, a good thing here. Not here. In this example, RX and TX use the same packet buffer. It's not a requirement, but if they do, then, of course, you can just uh, not have to copy anything. If you go get them packet into Rx, and you're going to resend something on Tx, you don't have to copy anything. If you, for example, get this packet buffer 1 in on Rx, you can just say, oh, I want to resend that. You just put this 1 into the Tx descriptor here, and it will send that. No copies. Uh, something important here was that we based this uh, ring from uh, Michael Serkin's uh, early proposal by Michael Serkin on his vert IO 1.1. But it has diverged after that. But we didn't want to invent something completely new. So we said, let's take something good that we like and just use it. But after that, you know, vert IO 1.1 has diverged. And we have diverged. And I don't know, I mean, if it's a good thing or not to track vert IO, because it's a standard. We have no idea when it's going to uh, actually be done. And it's probably also going to be, you know, have input from Microsoft, VMware. It's going to support block devices and things that we don't care about. So, but we did base it on that. And same thing for here. It's based on Michael Serkin's proposal. So how do you then use this? So this looks very familiar if you're familiar with AF Packet, which most of you are, of course. This is just uh, pseudocode. If you try to compile this, it won't work. And if it does compile, you should probably change your compiler. Yeah. So you first just create a socket, as usual. And then you state that, OK, I want packet version v4. 
And then we have something new here. We have the packet memread set socket opt. And this registers that packet buffer, that memory that you saw in the other uh, picture. So you can, you know, malloc a piece of memory, you can mmap a piece of memory and register it there. So why do we register memory from user space? It's just because we want a little bit more flexibility. So you can actually use something like huge pages and say, I'm going to map an area with huge pages and I'm going to register that as my packet buffer. And then you have something you recognize. It's a packet RX ring, packet TX ring, just like before. I look, uh, registers your TX descriptor ring and your RX descriptor ring. And then you bind to an interface. And what happens after that? Okay, so if you go back. So let's just give you some examples here. So what happens on RX and TX? So when when you start with RX, I mean, user space now owns all buffers because it was allocated in user space. So the first thing the user space program needs to do is actually send down some buffers to the kernel. And if you're a program that it's never going to send anything unless it gets something in RX, you can just take, you know, let's say you have 128 uh, descriptor rings or entries and one 1024 packet buffers, you can just take 128 of your packet buffers, just send them down to the kernel, because you know you're not going to need them. And what happens then is that, okay, Rx, the, the kernel driver will then take this, register them with the, uh, uh, yeah, with, the, with the hardware, and start filling them out. So the application in user space will then get buffers back with pointers to buffers that the driver has filled in. So it can say, okay, you got buffer 0, 1, 4, and 5, and they now have packets in them. And as soon as user space is done with this, maybe has processed 0 and 1, it just writes 0 and 1 in and say, yeah, yeah, now you can fill them in again. I don't need them anymore. And TX works in, in a similar way, but of course, it's opposite. The user space is the producer. So user space says, okay, I want to transmit buffer 2, 3, 4, and 5 and it just writes 2, 3, 4, and 5. The kernel will then say, okay, I have sent 2, 3, 4, and 5. They're completed. Now you can you know, reuse them if you want to. So that's the way uh, it, it works. And not something that, you know, packet buffers, they can be private, I mean by default, but they can also be shared between processes. If you do an mmap with map shared, you do fork, your child will actually inherit the packet buffer. So you can share them between processes, but you have to do it explicitly. The RX and TX descriptor rings are never shared. They're always private on every single process. And what we have here then, after you've done the bind, is something that's optional, and this is actually turning on the zero copy support. So some feedback that we have gotten is that, okay, you know, let's forget about this, and just just do Instead of doing a, uh, an AF packet v4, just just do a new AF, a new address. You know, uh, do I don't know what, what do you call it? AF uh, capture, AF zero copy, or something like that. And if you use that new socket type, then you assume zero copy. If the driver has support to zero copy, you get zero copy. If it doesn't have it, you get you know a fallback support, which is uh, copy mode. And then you don't actually need this at all. You can just uh, remove it. But after that then, it's just a, you know, a normal program. You have a loop, you read your message, you process it, you write it out again. So, pretty familiar. Yeah. If we look at then at the packet zero copy, what's the basic principle here? If you look at the left part of the diagram, this is what, you know, V2, V3, and V4 in copy mode without the zero copy works. It's like all the descriptors of the hardware and the packet buffer is owned by the kernel. And it takes care of it and translates these and copies them out in, into the application in user space. The difference with zero copy is that we map the packet buffer of the NIC hardware straight into user space. But note that the others are still the same. The RX and TX descriptors are only mapped to the kernel, only visible by the kernel. And then these descriptors are translated out into the V4 descriptors in user space. 
but the packets go go straight out. Uh, so each packet application needs its own packet buffer and txrxq pair. That's important. But you can share them if you want to, but you can never share the rx and tx uh, descriptor rings. They need to be separate. So what are the security and isolation requirements so for zero copy? So first of all, I mean, first thing you need to ensure is user space should not be able to crash kernel or other processes. And user space should not be able to read or write any kernel data. And user space should not be able to read and write packets from any other process unless, you know, the packet buffer is explicitly shared. If it's explicitly shared, I want it to be shared. So then that's kind of a feature instead. So the requirement here for an untrusted application with v4 is that you need hardware packets theory if you have more than one consumer of the packets. So if there are multiple destinations, you need to program flow director or something else, you know, in, in Unix in order to steer these packets to the right destination. If that's not available because you have really old NIC hardware or because you have a very funky protocol that's not supported or some you know, classification you need to do, then the kernel needs to own the packet buffer and copy the data out into user space. So at that point, it's not true zero copy anymore. It is a copy. Hello. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, so let's dig into the implementation. Um, so we sent out an RFC for uh, a week ago. Uh, so feel free to talk about that. As Magnus said, we have a lot of comments, so things will move around. Uh, still, uh, so I'll walk through the snapshot with current state that way. Uh, so what's, the implementation is really twofold. So first, there's adding the new ring structure into a packet, and then there's enabling zero copy. So zero copy is enabled via two new net device operations, NDOs. And the problem is when you add new NDOs is that you rely on other people to so implement them. So one of the key goals was to, okay, how, how do we do this as simple as possible? Uh, we do that by, by adding new structure to help with that, and also trying to abstract away uh, stuff like uh, uh, descriptor format and all the use space interaction. Uh, also, even though when we enable zero copy, we still want to be able to uh, to have XP. So if a driver has <coughs> XP support and it and, uh, sort of implements zero copy, we still want XP in its work. And for a driver that doesn't have uh, XP support and it adds the zero copy support, we thought that, hey, then you should get XP support for free. So uh, we have a structure that we call the packet array, which is, uh, that hopefully helps with this to achieve these goals. Um, so, what the packet array, array is, is it's a collection of frames that represent packets, right? Uh, you use the populate function to pull frames from user land uh, and, add, and they're added to the packet array. Uh, when, when, the pack, uh, when the frames are added to the packet array, they're also validated. So that means that when the driver starts using the frames within the packet array, they're already, already good to go. So there's no there's no error checking either. there. <coughs> um, so, okay, the, the packet array is populated, but so the driver starts using the frames. Uh, it uses the frame, and when it's done, uh, for example, by changing the, the length or the descriptors of the packet array, uh, the, the driver can flush back these uh, frames to use, uh, to, uh, use land for, uh, again, using the flush. So that's sort of, you populate the packet array, use a populate, and then you turn it to use line for, uh, use a flush. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, uh, functions to iterate this array, and also uh, uh, to get something that's called a frame set, which is a view in the packet array. So you can sort of flush a part of this. Uh, say that you want to flush and packets down to use line. Uh, and 
we're using this structure pretty much everywhere. So we're using it in any packet and in, in the two example implementations uh, in the drivers. Uh, and for us, we have cloud. So uh, <coughs> another way of viewing the packet array is as an allocator. So you can as a driver ask the packet array for a frame, and then you can return it. <coughs> Right, just a quick walk down. Uh, so this is the i40 driver. It's an Intel uh, 4 gig NIC. Uh, just some examples how we use the factory. array. So first, uh, what's not shown here in the Oryx path is the setup phase. So when we enable zero copy, we, uh, 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 we walk the hardware descriptor ring and fill it with the buffers to be filled by the NIC, right? Uh, so we fill uh, the hardware descriptor rings with sort of empty frames and tell the device to start receiving frames. So the packet arrives on the wire uh, and we end up, uh, the hardware tells the kernel like, hey, there's, job to, uh, there's stuff to be done. So we, we enter the handler here. Uh, and this path is real simple. So you just walk the hardware descriptor ring. Uh, if the hardware has filled in the, the ring, we update the corresponding entry in the packet array, for example, the length. And we do this for each entry, and then we flush it back to uh, user length. Uh, and we also, when, uh, when we sort of uh, clear this ring, we're also allocating new entries, and we use the packet array for that as well. So the packet array not only keeps the state of What's outstanding to make, but it also uh, we also use that as for allocation. Uh, on the egress path, it's somewhat similar. With one difference is that we instead of the hardware initiate saying to the kernel just for to be done, we initiate that from a uh, system call. So we do uh, a send message. Uh, the driver enters the handler. We uh, we populate the frame, we pick uh, frames with data from user land, place them on the hardware ring. Uh, uh, we tell the hardware to start transfer, wait for the transfer com to complete, we enter the handler again, and then we flash the, uh, we complete the, uh, the, the frames back to user land again. Oh, sorry. All right, so I'm just to showcase, we also implement the beef for, uh, so which is a virtual driver. Uh, the current implementation only support, only works if you have the recap enabled at both ends of the pair. So uh, uh, <coughs> obviously that's not really useful, but we have, <laughs> we have a, a version that we haven't released yet that, that supports both zero copy and SVB. Uh, Anyway, so in this case, if we have zero copy enabled in both ends, it's really easy. So you take one, each end of the pair, the, the TX and the RX pair, uh, you populate the packet array, you do the copy, and then you flush back to user end. Right, so as I said earlier, the, uh, we want the XP support to be built in. So the goal was to have, when you call flush to post uh, the phrase back to uh, use land, XTP, if it was enabled, would, would be executed and acted upon. Uh, so in the RFC, we're doing that by separate calls and not built in the flush, but it's still there. Uh, but the idea is to execute each, uh, each frame, act on it, and then flush it. Uh, so one minor detail is that if, if you execute an XTP program that's for a zero copy queue, when you call XTP pass, pass means pass it to use the land, doesn't mean pass it to the kernel stack. So there's a, a bit of a amount of that. Right, so benchmarking. Uh, so we did some tests on, uh, on the RC. Uh, and this is set up. We're using a somewhat new server machine. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it's the the benchmark is only for throughput, so there's no way to put the measurement down. So expect to be bad because that is measuring it. Right? Uh, and we're only using it's just like a two core benchmark. So only um, there's a kernel side and there's a default side. So everything in the kernel is down from the software to our front. So both uh, ingress and egress is down from the same software to our which is not up more for our case, but that's the way it has like this. Uh, what else? We're steering all the traffic, just one queue, uh, and we're generating the load the uh, commercial type generator. Right, so this is for 64 byte packets, and FBL means, means Fort Bell, which is Intel speak for I480. Uh, and we ran four different scenarios. First, dark drop, which is simply pull the packet and drop it, do not touch the data. It's push, which is transfer only scenario. L2 forward is uh, uh, a simple uh, max swap. So you get back in, you swap the max and send it out to them. Uh, and then just for fun, we implement the V4 support into the VCAP, so we can run this V dump. Uh, and some comments on the results here. So as you can see, the copy is about 24 times faster than the, the copy versions. Uh, as for copy mode, it's sort of mixed bag. So we're seeing uh, sometimes we're pretty good on Rx, but as for TX, we're still, there's a lot of things to do there. For example, on the copy path, we're doing not really good blocking and uh, uh, for the zero copy path, we need to, as I said, we're running both TX and RX in the same software draft. And I want to issue a system call as well, so. Right, so moving on to large packets. Uh, what's maybe interesting here, compared to the others, that we're seeing that V2 and V3 sort of heard from uh, uh, from the MAM copy. So we're uh, about 10% faster because we're aligning the MAM copy. Uh, as for zero copy, we're line rate for uh, ARC drop. But again, since the TX path is not really optimized, uh, we're not really reaching line rate there. But the plan is, of course, to have line rate uh, in the whole column. All right, so let's go back to XTP. So one thing that we realized when we implemented the MDOs for the drivers was that if you sort of squint your eyes, you can see that that the XTP redirect uh, uh, MDOs, uh, transmit and flush, they're somewhat similar to what we're using. So uh, one idea that we had was that maybe you could extend the existing uh, XTP transmit uh, MDOs to support like an explicit uh, fee allocation, because then we could like, pass our uh, allocator method, and uh, we could reuse the existing NDOs. So ideally, it would be nice not having to add new NDOs. Uh, as for as for ingress, it's maybe we're thinking about if it would be possible to add some kind of NDO that we sort of told the driver to use an explicit memory allocator. So to use this, for example, packet array as a memory, memory allocator instead of using the page allocator. So uh, we have some faults there, but we haven't really tried it out yet. But ideally, we'd like to have an NDO that's not strictly uh, bound to our zero copy implementation. And ideally, if we could reuse XPT with some minor uh, Modification that would be added as well. All right, moving on to more sort of crazy ideas. Uh, we have one thought that it would use XTP for rewriting the scripter. So, for example, you enable zero copy and then you add XP program. Let's say, can we translate the V4 descriptor to say Verdio on the 
uh, to use the same path for multiple surface. Uh, that would, have a, however, need a new path for egress. So we would need an XP drone to execute the egress path as well. Uh, what else? Yeah, so in our C, we have something called pass to kernel, which is a convenient function. So when you enter uh, for a zero copy path, when you execute the program, we pass a copy to all the data to the kernel stack. We call that. But that's some discussions here. It's seems more reasonable to use the XP redi redirect call or the return action and then uh, have a file saying ingress. So we, instead of adding a new action, which is uh, well, we uh, reuse the XP redirect. Uh, another thought well, there, what made it would make sense to have one XP program per ring because the, the program that, that you enabled for the zero copy uh, queues might not be, or might be the case that you don't want that to be the same as, for example, the SVD path. Still, that's, that's not something we're implemented, but just thought about. Uh, and with that, back to you, Magnus. Okay, RC, tons of stuff to do. And uh, after this uh, conference, lots more than on this page. Uh, but uh, yeah, before this conference, we had a number of things we, we wanted to do with RC. Uh, for example, we have some problems with the user interface uh, uh, ring structure. If you have a loop-sided uh, system where either the user space consumes much faster than the kernel, or kernel consumes much faster than user space, which I think is always going to be the case, it's always going to be an imbalance, the current ring structure gets into performance problems. Because there's lots of contention on that flag and I think there was a post by Michael Serkin and some patch for another ring structure where he noticed that this. So we have to get away from that. Because I think that's going to be a common case that one of them will try to hit this, uh, this flag and, and, and loop on it, or you know, at least for a while. And that actually brings down the performance of the whole system because you have lots of ping ponging of cache packets in, in the system. Uh, another thing that we have a problem with is that if you have an asymmetric system where you have a process that consumes packets like just Rx, and you have another process that does the Tx. Then, uh, of course, you're not gonna you receive lots of packets, but you're not gonna send back lots of packets with uh, on that process. And with the current ring structure, you need to mark even if you're just sending down empty stuff. You need to mark every single descriptor. What we need instead is something that just says, okay just return 512 descriptors to kernel and just use them by just add, you know, modifying a pointer or something like that. We don't want to go through 512 entries and mark them. That's, that's not all. But the current ring structure works very well for the symmetric case where, you know, the same process actually does both Rx and Tx. Yeah. And yes, continued XTP integration into packet arrays, uh, optimized performance, we haven't really started that. We, uh, the copy path, we need to show a lot more love, I think, and also the TX path. But we'll, we'll take care of that. We also need that SKB to be for conversions that uh, Björn talked about, uh, to be able to support a, a virtual device between two processes, where one of the ends might use you know, SKBs and other ones uses uh, you know, V4. Uh, also support for shared packet buffers. Uh, the current packet memory does not support it, so we need to fix that. Uh, also that the packet buffer is unnecessarily pinned for virtual devices. That's just uh, sloppy from us. We should just get rid of that. Uh, and then we have unifying the V4 and SKB receive path in the I40 driver to make it simpler and, and smaller. Uh, and also support for packet spanning multiple frames. So currently, there can only be one frame. Uh, and the last thing here is disassociate the packet array implementation from the V4 queue structure. Today, the packet array internally assumes that it's going to put these packets in a V4 format. But if you want to implement something like the XTP rewrite, descriptor rewrite support, you know, it might be Vertionet on the other side, or you know, V2, who knows, something else. So then that needs to be disassociated. And you need to do that in that TP4A populate and flush. And also for the SKB case, 
you need that because you might produce it into an SKB instead that goes to the kernel, for example. And of course, there's lots of things that you detected so that we need to do. For example, do a lot of uh, pre-patches to the i 4 t kernel to just condensate exactly what's needed for the zero copy support and lots of other things that we need to go and do. And some of the things that you suggested will actually completely change the title of this talk and make it obsolete. Uh, for example, if we say it's AF packet capture, AF packet zero copy, then yes, we, ne we need to fix that too. And yes, future work. I mean, we will be very busy with the first one, so there will probably be no future work. But uh, we need to get a proper patch set. And the suggestion there was just focus on Rx to start with, just drop the TX. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, we might want to try implementing the zero copy support for other devices. I mean, now we just try two, but does it work for other ones? I mean, we really need to try out a few to know if it's, uh, if it's the right way or not. Uh, and we really need to try this interface out on real workloads. So I mean, we've been using micro benchmarks. Micro benchmarks is just micro benchmarks. It's very far from real application. TCP dump is also simple. We need some real workloads and to see if this really flies. Uh, so that's, I think that's very important. As I think Dave said, we don't want to do a V1, V2, V3, V4 of, of, of this, you know, and, and so on, V5. Uh, so let's try it to get right. Uh, yes, and what Bjorn talked about, uh, need to get up the performance of TX there, maybe get rid of the syscall, or just try to get rid of it from the RX core at least. And uh, packet steering using XTP, and metadata support. But the metadata support, hopefully, we can just ride on the metadata support in XTP here, because we don't assume a specific data format, and we don't write anything in, into the data. So hopefully, we can just ride on the metadata support in XTP. That's our hope. Hi. Right. So acknowledgments. So thank you very much, guys. Alexei, Alexander, Jesper, you know, for all your comments on the early RFC drafts you, you got to see before it was sent out. You really helped improve the quality of it. And also want to uh, thank some internal colleagues, Rami, Jeff, Ferru, Chi. You helped with the code and you know performance results and tests and stuff like that. And also developers of RDMA, NetMath, PFRing. I mean, you know, you were there first. So you really for the data path, there's lots of inspiration from that. So. Thank you. And also, of course, thank you all for all your comments you know, and feedback uh, during this, these days. So finally, to conclude, so we introduced this AF packet v4 and packet zero copy for getting better AF packet uh, performance. And try to integrate it with XTP. And we introduced something called packet arrays to facilitate the implementation and uh, also to improve performance of it. And we showed that, at least on the fourth wheel NIC, you could get 60 to 40 times the performance improvements for some simple micro benchmark that we had. Uh, there's still lots of performance optimization work to be performed. We haven't really started there, so we think we can, we can do better for sure. Uh, so, and there's lots of exciting XCP extensions, I think, that are possible in conjunction with an interface like this. But that's definitely for future work. So I think future looks you know, bright and promising and full of work. Thank you. Questions? Hi, uh, this looks great. I'm sure um, uh, we are absolutely not the primary use case of this code, but um, we have a packet translation daemon that uses packet rx ring and then turns the packets around, translates them between IPv4 and IPv6, and then spits them out again. And this looks like it would be a really good fit for it, except I don't quite understand the steering and coexistence strategy. You say Nick has to support hardware steering, but I don't really know what that means. It, does it mean like we can push down a BPF filter and say, like, give me only these packets and send them up only to this socket? Or is it sort of much more invasive than that? Try to get this one. All right. Um, so the default mode without any steering, 
that they were talking about would be to send. Um, All right, I got some more time. Um, so the, let me try to restart this then. <laughs> uh, so this binds to a specific hardware ring. So and they get the, you, the way you get zero copy is then every packet that comes into that hardware ring gets zero copied into user space. So y you could bind to all of the hardware rings and get every packet that ever that goes into the NIC into user space zero copied, and, and then there would be no filtering. It would just be all packets go to your v4 v6 translator or whatever you have in user space. Um, but there are cases where you only want specific types of packets. Like you might never want non-IP packets in this case, right? Makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, but because we're doing the zero copy, we need to let the hardware know not to put those kinds of packets on the rings that are bound to the user space because of the zero copy, because the hardware is actually doing the DMA into user space. And so th the way, the mechanism to do this is any of the hardware offload kind of steering mechanisms that we have in the kernel today. And so flow director is one of them, which lets you push down a, uh, like a, usually it's a tuple, or um, you say, I want these IP addresses, or I want this protocol type, down into the hardware and say, send all that traffic to Q1. So you could do something in this case, like say, I want all of the IP packets to be on Qs 2, 3, and 4, and I'm going to bind my application to those. And anything that's not that type should go to Q1 and be its ARP or something like this. Um, the BPF comment is interesting because some hardware can offload BPF. You could imagine that this type of hardware could then say, using this BPF filter, send it to this queue that does the zero copy. So, does that uh, answer the question? Yeah, we, in this case, we we have a dedicated IPv6 address that we could use, and we just say, like, don't pass this to the kernel networking stack at all. Because in AF packet v3, right, the packets go both to your socket and to the yeah. kernel, um, and you do that too here in v4, except you can't do zero copy. Right. So, but yes, in our case, we just pass down, say, hey, anything that comes to this v6 address, essentially, though, we're bypassing the stack, right, for packets to that IPv6 address, which push Correct. down this flow and comes to our socket, which, which is what we want, actually. But Yeah, because of the zero copy nature of the DMA, you have to do the copy. And um, yeah, so you just push down a filter for your IPv6 address. It'll always get into user space zero copied. And then you'll do your translation and send it wherever else it needs to go at that point. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh. Uh, I just want to quickly reiterate something we discussed at NetConf when John uh, presented this, uh, the, the design of this, and uh, we were talking about doing a separate address family like AF Capture or something like that. Uh, I think it would be preferred to have a software implementation where copies are performed if the NDOs are in presence so that applications can be written to this API regardless of the presence of hardware support and transparently they would take advantage of this hardware support should they then run that application on a machine that has it. So I think that's an important aspect of uh, think looking forward about how to design this. So just please keep that in mind. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. So early on, you mentioned you, you viewed this as replacing some SRIOV use cases. Could you expand on that a little bit? Do you want me to do this one, or do you want to give it a shot? Uh, sure. So, and they can add more to this. I, I think there are some known limitations of SRIOV. For instance, you're only allowed 64 or 128 VFs um, on a NIC that might have thousands of queues and filters for you know the ability to filter thousands of different kind of flows. Um, this type of interface wouldn't have any of those limitations. So in theory, you could have thousands of these applications all doing zero copy based on different flows. Um, and all of these guys, they might know more about platform things. And also for this, like teleco applications, it's uh, quite, uh, you know, common that people just put VFs into user space uh, to get the performance. But of course, that hurts because you're hardware dependent and a lot of other things that are not good. Uh, so if you can get rid of that, you can also get bifurcation, which is horrible if you have a long maintenance cycle of your software. Uh, lots of other problems. So if you can get rid of that thing of, you know, just exposing SRVFs into user space, that's worth a lot. Uh, I noticed the complete lack of any mention of offloads. I'm wondering if you have any uh, ideas or comments, in particular checksumming and segmentation. No, actually uh, not. I mean, we're thinking about that in the, in the metadata work to, to tackle that, but we don't have any 
offload support. But it's important. It, it should be there. Some of them are really important. So, but we haven't we haven't tackled that yet. Yeah, just want to comment on the SRA of limitation you mentioned. So the number of VFs, it's the limitation you mentioned. Uh, I, I guess it's uh, implementation specific, right? It's not the spec limitation. The, uh, there are some limitations in the spec, right? The maximum number of VFs based on the PCIe spec. But I think. The spec allows thousands of them, not 64 or, or the numbers like this. This depends on how you implement the PCIe spec and device specific. So a lot of the devices have fairly limited um, PCIe uh, number of VFs that they support. Um, and maybe somebody who's more familiar with the actual s hardware spec can s speak to it. But most hardware that I have has a limit of 128. I, I know hard, the hard, hard Linux that uh, support more. So. What's that? Much more. The, the, there are hard Linux that support much more. Yeah. If you if you look at the PCI spec, it's eight bits max, because it, it right? Am I correct? Sixteen, yeah, sixteen bits. But you can you can you can simulate your own VFs from from your host to the host if you have an internal chip. I don't think it, it does. It. I think the point here is a little bit. Uh, John's thing is a little bit simpler, right? When if you're doing granularity of a device, everything, buffers, queues, everything needs to be bound and assigned up front because if you have, let's say you have 64 devices, 63 of them need, need to be provisioned, you can't do it later. If you're doing it on a per flow basis, you can change the assignment and the binding as a flow comes online. And I think it gives you better utilization and flexibility. I, I, yeah, this is yeah. a great, wait, this is another reason not to try to pre-allocate all your VFs. I think you can similarly also change the assignment of VF to a user process dynamically, so I'm not sure. Uh, okay. All right, I can take it offline. Someone else? Uh, a couple of comments over there on the other side. Looks like Stephen's got a comment. Uh, with regards to SRV, more than the scalability, I think what you're providing is, you know, you create a VM, you are probably signing up for a particular interface, what IO or whatever, you know, you really don't want to transition that. So you have your ring structure defined in the, you know, the virtual interface, uh, either direct assigned one or emulated one. With this, you're getting almost the close performance of a direct assigned interface because you're doing a direct copy of your packets, although you're doing a descriptor translation, which gives you the freedom of having a very independent ring structure in your VM, and it is not bound <laughs> to what is implemented in the hardware. I think that's the that's the most important point here. Anybody else? <laughs> so regarding to small packets, so I think this is currently the issue, how you handle a small 64 bytes um, performance. Do you have any idea how to resolve that? Because w w do you know what, what problem are you talking about specifically? I'm talking about if, uh, as you see in the performance test, the, the problem that's for every descriptor, you need to do something. So if it's a small packet, then the packet per second will be not efficient. Yeah, I mean, getting more than 33 million packets, you mean up to 40 or 50. Is that what you want? Yep. Yeah, I mean, we, we know we have some problems with the ring structure because it creates lots of cache bouncing effects, for example, that uh, we need to get rid of. So I don't know how much we'll gain by doing that. Uh, we also noticed that it's really important to look at the iCache uh, and really optimize the code for having everything in the iCache. So it's actually better usually to go through the data multiple times and but have better iCache ratio, uh, no, ratio uh, or better iCache miss rate, you can say, or hit rate. Uh, so they, uh, there are lots of things we can do, but I, I don't know how much they're going to you know, impact this. We haven't really performance optimized this. We, I mean, when we wrote the paper, when you know, we started measuring this, and of course we discovered things that, oh, 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 you know, we need to fix this. So we fixed a couple of things, but mainly in the zero copy case to get you to this, but there's much more to do. And also in this packet area, one, one thing we wanted to do is that the, the optimal access pattern of your data and, and your, your instructions is actually not very obvious. So we wanted to hide that in, in there. So that you, when you fetch these uh, 
uh, frames from the buffer, you get it in the in the correct order. That's optimal for the for the hardware with you know, all the prefetches. None of that has been implemented, but that's a, a goal that we have. I don't know what we'll get to, but I would surprise if we can't get higher than this. Then I'll uh, I'll eat my hat next NetDev. You know, you can put ketchup on it or something, but we want to beat that at least. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Oh. Uh, we need. Um, I had a couple questions. The first one was, uh, I assume you've got to deal with all these nasty cases like I got a malicious application that asks for AF packet v4 and then M, unma M unmaps the buffer that it told you was the ring and things like that, or it crashes. And rebinds and, yeah. and disables zero copy in the middle of it, yeah. yes. Um, or at one of the processes just disable zero copy, but the other one keeps it on. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> so there's all those, there's all these new corner cases. Yes. Um, the other one is uh, part of the issue at a lot of these interfaces is how to do polling or an event based model um, application or one or the other or both or trading it off and. That's often a very tough, tough thing to deal with. And on the VF side, uh, it would be nice to be able to do this on a VF because, or a ring that's in a, some part of a VF because you could even get to the extreme of a Docker container that wants to do this on a VF that's been passed to it. Yeah. Um, so don't say it only works on the PF it only works on the host side because that yeah, will yeah, limit yeah, it a true. lot. Because the real problems we have today are networking that going through eight layers to get to an application and the latency performance is terrible because it's going through eight layers. And I look at this as a great way to get rid of that if we can continue to make that punch through all the way up to the application. Yeah, good point, I agree. Anyone else? Oh, uh, Do we get lunch now? Well, we want to thank you first. Thank you. So I can only give one gift. <laughs>